We've got uh, land stewardship with Elisa Velador. She was in my class 2015 and she's a conservation educator, Texas Wildlife Association and East Foundation. And then second, we've got Kelly Mikowski, superintendent at Resaca de la Palma State Park. So um, her talk is a little bit different than forest ecology, but it'll be interesting no matter what. So uh, let me, I think Robert's going, I'm gonna stop sharing and Robert's going to make um, Elisa the presenter and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Elisa. Um, so she's, I, I already told you what, what she does. She brings natural resource education to K through 12 students of the Rio Grande Valley. She earned her bachelor's and, and master's degrees in biology at the UT Brownsville and Texas Southmost College. Um, she has eight years experience teaching high school science where she always ex incorporated nature into the classroom. And I told you she's a certified member of our chapter in 2015. And she is was born and raised in Brownsville, enjoys camping, hunting, fishing, and spending time in nature with her husband and two boys. And she loves reaching out to today's youth and helping teachers incorporate the land stewardship message into their classroom. And she's confident that many generations will benefit from Texas natural resources now and well into the future. Welcome, Elisa. And I think, oh, Robert made you the presenter. So do you see the share? Yes, thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. All Absolutely. right, so I am going to share my screen, hopefully. <laughs> Let's see. Mm -hmm. We see it. Are you seeing a split screen or just my PowerPoint? We I see, go ahead. We see the presenter version with your notes and so forth. That's a, okay. There, we go. Yep. there you go. That's perfect. All right. Well, um, whether to get really technical with this presentation or to keep it basic, I think it's somewhere in between. So <laughs> hopefully it makes sense to everyone. So Barbara, you, you, you know, you gave me a really good introduction, um, but just kind of to add to that, I'm a conservation educator for the five southernmost counties of Texas, and I've been on board with the East Foundation and with the Texas Wildlife Association for the past nine years. So time has flown by. Um, so part of what I do is I do um, classroom presentations um, called Wildlife by Design uh, in classrooms uh, all over the valley and teachers that teach um, all the way from kinder to 12th grade are welcome to um, book a presentation. Everything that we offer is free. Um, I do teacher workshops in the summertime. I take kids out to El Sal's Ranch in Port Mansfield for field lessons. And I'm also an instructor for the Land Stewardship Ambassador Program that we have um, with partnership with Witte Museum in San Antonio. So. We teach 15 uh, students here from Cameron County. Um, they basically uh, get a lot of instruction on land stewardship and how to be an advocate for our natural resources. Um, and they become basically an ambassador um, within their community. So, um, you know, with the hopes that maybe they'll pursue a um, you know, career in natural resource, uh, natural resources or something like that, something related. Um, we, we always try to, um, present them with a lot of different options as far as career options. Um, so it's a really good program. It's a 10 week program that we offer for high school students. Um, just in case you're interested in contacting me, here's my phone number, my email. You're more than welcome to send me questions or 
um, you know, book a program if you're if you are a teacher or if you know teacher friends, just pass along my information. Um, so just a little bit about Texas Wildlife Association, just in case you've never heard of us before. We are a membership based group. Uh, we have members all over the state and uh, basically anybody can be a member of TWA. If you enjoy the outdoors, if you like fishing, if you like hunting, if you are interested in conserving our natural resources and um, basically supporting our education programs. Uh, you can check out our website and, and become a member. But basically, if we were to add up all of the land that our members own, it would be 40 million acres across the state of Texas. And so our goal with these landowners is to encourage them and help them to conserve the natural resources found on their land. So TWA was established in 1985, and basically it was just, you know, landowners that were um, interested in protecting hunting and property rights on their on their land. So that's kind of how it started. And we have, well, I'm part of the formal education team of TWA. We do have three branches. One of them is the conservation legacy branch. Um, that's our education branch. So we have youth education and we also have adult education. I, of course, am more involved in the youth education aspect. Uh, we have lots of different programs. We have discovery trunks that we ship out to teachers um, all year long. And we have wildlife by design presentations. Those are the ones that we go into the classrooms. Um, currently, we have eight educators throughout the state that kind of do what I do for TWA. And um, we do teacher workshops in the summertime. We have distance learning on our website. And actually, recently, we started a land, water, and wildlife expedition program for, for families. So um, that information is on our website. There's different programs available. Um, everything that we offer is pretty much free of charge. Um, and we also publish a magazine called Critter Connections for, for students um, that are in kinder through sixth grade. So this is just kind of our landing page of our website. If you're interested, it's texas-wildlife.org and you'll find all kinds of information in there. Uh, the East Foundation partnered with TWA. So they kind of partnered together and they created my position here in the RGV. Um, and basically the East Foundation manages 217,000 acres of native rangeland here in South Texas. Uh, it's six separate branches uh, in different counties. Um, basically, we use those branches for science, um, education, and also cattle ranching. So we do produce beef on the ranches, and um, the foundation was, was started through the generous gift of the East family. Uh, Robert East was the, the founder, um, and it was through his... Um, I guess his foresight that the foundation was started. So the mis mission of the East Foundation is to promote the advancement of land stewardship through ranching science and education. So we have also a lot of different education programs going on. Um, next week, we're going to host 1,800 students out on the El South Ranch in Port Mansfield for our annual Behind the Gates event. Um, so we take fifth graders out there and it's, uh, basically a week long of fun outdoor learning. We also host behind the gates for eighth graders in our headquarters ranch. That one is called San Antonio Viejo ranch and it's south of Hebronville. Um, so we do, we, aside from behind the gates, we do regular field lessons throughout the, uh, throughout the year on two ranches, the El South ranch and San Antonio Viejo. We also, like I mentioned earlier, have the Land Stewardship Ambassador Program available for high school students. And then we also have virtual field lessons that uh, teachers and students can tune into on Thursdays. So here's just a couple of um, little snapshots of field lessons on the South Ranch. Um, kids out there have a lot of fun. We teach them um, about ranching and wildlife in a fun outdoor um, experience. We set up uh, different activities 
and they just kind of, um, you know, hop on the bus and go visit us at the ranch. Uh, this is our new education site. It's called the Elif El South Education Center. Um, we broke ground about a year and a half ago, and now um, it's been hosting students. Thousands of students go every year. This is just during behind the gates when we have all the fifth graders out there. Um, but we, you know, we have smaller field lessons throughout the year as well. Just an aerial view of the of the area. We have a large pavilion where the kids eat um, lunch, and then we have six smaller pavilions where they go do activities. Um, so, yeah, this is just a couple of different pictures of field lessons. Um, sometimes if the kids are lucky, they'll get to see, you know, wild animals right in their education center. So I don't know if you guys can see the, the deer on the bottom picture, but that's, um, that happened during, during one of the field lessons. So that was really cool. Um, if you're interested, I do, um, you know, take volunteers out there. Uh, there's multiple days available throughout the school year. Typically, you'll be out there from 8 a.m. to about 2 p.m. Um, you do have the option to carpool with me. We can meet up um, in Harlingen or wherever you're from. We can, um, I'm from Brownsville, so it just kind of, Harlingen is on the way and it's kind of like the, you know, central point of meeting for most people. Um, or we can simply meet at the gate at Port Mansfield. And of course, um, duties would be to kind of help set up, you know, different activities, set up materials, take down, help during lunch, etc., clean up after the kids are gone. Um, and so, yeah, if you're interested, contact me and we'll put you on the schedule and you can help um, educate kids out at the ranch. So um, we do have a website, eastfoundation.net, and feel free to visit and just kind of check out our organization and uh, what we do. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of research out on the land and, um, and education and of course, cattle ranching. All right, so again, I didn't know how, how um, technical to get with the um, presentation, but here it goes. Um, so I was asked to talk to you guys about land stewardship. Um, land stewardship is kind of the central message that we um, give students when they visit us, when we go to schools and visit them, um, within our lessons that teachers use, whenever they check out a discovery trunk, land stewardship is always a focus. And so simply put, land stewardship means taking care of our land. Um, it's like the simplest, simplest definition that, that I could think of. Um, when we talk to students, especially young kids, you know, we explain that the word steward means caretaker. So when we say land steward, that means it's someone who takes care of their land. And within the context of what I do, the main goal of land stewardship is the long-term conservation of the land, water, and wildlife on a specific property. So with TWA, we always talk about how 95% of the land here in Texas is privately owned. And so it's up to those ordinary individual landowners to make decisions that are going to, you know, impact their, their land. And so we always talk about how we encourage people to do what's right for the life uh, for the land and the life that depends on it. So to understand land stewardship, we have to understand where, when, and why the need for it started. So I, um, I have this really good document that kind of outlines the, um, basically it's kind of like a timeline of conservation. And so that's kind of where I wanted to start today, just to kind of give everybody some background of like, okay, why do we need to conserve our land in the first place? Why should we care about land stewardship? Well, we have to go back in time to where, um, you know, this land was first settled to kind of understand why um, this whole um, concept of land stewardship even started. So long time ago, um, in the early 1500s, uh, of course, this was, you know, kind of 
when Europeans first started to settle the land, there were three to five million Native Americans that lived on what is now called the United States. They hunted, they gathered food. Um, and yeah, when there was a lot of them, when there was a lot of Native Americans in those areas, yeah, they could decimate lots of animals. They hunted a lot of them. Um, mid 1500s to 1600s, you know, more people started coming over from Europe. They brought diseases that were, you know, infectious diseases, and they started to wipe out lots of Native people. And they started to bring, you know, domestic horses, domestic cattle, sheep, goats, pigs. They were all introduced to North America where before we didn't have these types of animals. And with that, with those animals, um, they started transmitting diseases to wildlife populations and they started to kind of take over the land. Um, so people started to clear land for farming, hunting, um, and trapping, especially in the East Coast, when people started arriving uh, in the East Coast, the fur trade was really big and they started to, you know, whatever animals they found here in, in this continent, they started to collect them for fur harvesting and they would send it to, to Europe because Europe had a big market for, um, for fur coats and, and things like that. So wildlife populations declined and settlers actually blamed um, the whole entire loss on predators. They thought, well, the predators are the ones that are decimating the wild game, like um, like the deer that we so depend on for food and, and the turkeys and everything. They thought, okay, predators are to blame. So they started to hunt all the wolves. And um, some states even started to pay people to hunt wolves. Um, other states, they started to enact close seasons for deer hunting because their population was declining so much. Um, in the 1700s, fur trade was still expanding. And since the East Coast was kind of, okay, we've, we're done with all the animals here, now let's move westward. So they started looking towards the West. Um, early 1800s, Lewis and Clark expedition, they saw an abundance of you know, bears and herds of bison everywhere, herds of deer, prairie dog towns that were like miles and miles wide, billions of birds um, on their journey. So that's what they saw on their journey west. And so people started to migrate um, towards the west coast. And by the mid 1800s, they were really, really having a detrimental effect on the bison population. Um, of course, they were, you know, killed for their fur, for their thick pelts and other products that they would get from, from these animals. And the picture here shows just, it's a pile of skulls. That's what it is. Um, and so it's just basically almost went to extinction. Um, in 1842, the Supreme Court decided um, the public trust doctrine uh, where they decided that U.S. wildlife and fish belong to all people, and and basically the stewardship of those fauna is entrusted to individual states. Um, there was a man who tried to sue and tried to keep people from collecting oysters from his what what he thought was his waters, um, but Supreme Court um, shut him down and they said, you know what, the wildlife belongs to everyone. Um, in 1872, uh, President Grant established the first national park, which was Yellowstone. And so here people are starting to realize, you know what, um, it's probably a good idea to conserve some of this land. Um, because if not, everything's, you know, people are going to take over everything. And so we have to preserve some of it. Um, in 1886, there was a census. And they realized that only 540 bison remained in the entire United States. And um, they were in Yellowstone area of Montana. Um, so by that time, by the late 1880s, a lot of different hunting and conservation groups started to form scientific clubs, for example, Audubon Society, the League of American Sportsmen, the Sierra Club, the Boone and Crockett Club. 
they started to kind of um, coalesce and form. Um, and these groups started to kind of educate others that, you know, conservation was important. They, they realized that hunting and conservation go together. Um, they realized that, hey, if you enjoy hunting, but you hunt with abandon, that's that's going to decimate the population. So it's it's good to know that you can have that resource available for the future. Um, so that's when people started to realize uh, the importance of conservation. Um, la late 1890s, early 1900s is known as the age of the conservation, uh, age of conservation legislation because a lot of laws were enacted during this period of time. Um, President Roosevelt, he set aside 230 million acres just in his presidency alone. And um, that included a lot of national parks and wildlife refuges. Um, here's a picture of him with, um, I think it's John Muir here, and they are they're kind of admiring the scenery at one of the national parks. Um, but basically, in the early 1900s, they uh, started to enact hunting laws nationwide, and a lot of wildlife reforestation efforts started in the 1900s. Um, Pennsylvania became the first state to enact, um, you know, fishing licenses. They started to require fishing, uh, hunting licenses, sorry. And uh, Congress passed the Migratory Bird Stamp Act, and that helped to protect 5.3 million acres of waterfowl habitat to date. So basically they said, okay, if you're gonna buy a stamp, that part of that money is gonna go to um, migratory birds and conserving their habitat. So that brought in a lot of funding for that. And then um, in the early 1930s, this is more or less when um, the profession of wildlife conservation and management was born. Aldo Leopold was the first person who actually taught a class on wildlife management, and this was at the University of Wisconsin. Um, in 1935, the Soil Conservation Services Farm, now known as NRCS, um, and then 1937, the, the Pittman uh, on basically this act was um, for putting a tax on certain hunting equipment. So part of that money was used for wildlife restoration projects, research and education. After World War II, hunting licenses, um, the sales shot up and the funds for those sales helped to restock many species of wildlife. So pronghorn, uh, deer, bear, uh, turkeys, all kinds of animals. Um, in 1945, sorry, 1949, um, Aldo Leopold's A Sand Colony Almanac is put, and that was a really instrumental book that um, people still read today. Um, we actually use that book uh, in our Land Stewardship Ambassador program, and we um, there's a lot of people that quote it, and his teachings are basically still relevant today. Um, in 1964, Johnson established the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and he signed the Wilderness Act and Wild and, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So all of that legislation um, that we have today kind of started during that time. Uh, in modern times, um, in 1969, I think this was during Nixon's era, um, he helped to establish the Endangered Species Conservation Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Clean Air Act. Uh, the EPA was established around this time. And then CITES, which is a, a Convention on International Trade in Endangered Flora and Fauna Species Act, takes effect in the U.S. So it kind of was the, the, first, um, the first act that was kind of like an inter, international um, agreement um, with other countries. And then uh, in 1993, the National Biological Survey is formed, the Kyoto Protocol in 1998, that's to cut greenhouse gases. Um, I think this was during Clinton's time. And then um, in 2000, Conservation and Reinvestment Act, now called the program. That program actually allowed for um, some of the monies from US Fish and Wildlife to go to the states so that the states could actually implement uh, conservation programs. 
And then in 2010, Obama placed a moratorium on drilling um, after the BP oil spill that affected the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and then 2020, um, very recently, um, the Great American Outdoors Act was signed, and that one is going to help a lot of um, federal land, um, the national parks, get much needed um, projects going. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to get fixed, and there's a lot of um, projects that they would like to do. So now this funding is going to be available for them. And then, of course, also um, within our own state, Texas Parks and Wildlife will also benefit from these funds. So that was one of the ones that was very recent that is going to benefit conservation. So um, basically what we've learned through this conservation timeline is that, okay, we saw what happened when there were no regulations, people would just hunt all year long without limits. You didn't even need a hunting license, nothing. Um, and now we see the effects of that. We now, there was a lot of different species that benefited from, um, you know, conservation. For example, beavers, beavers almost went extinct. And because laws were enacted um, that said, hey, you can only hunt beavers during a certain time of the year. And if you have a permit, you can only take um, a certain number of beavers for your fur fur trade. And so that actually allowed beavers to um, recover and and um, their population is now um, back to what it was before. And if you've ever read anything about beavers, they are a keystone species within their little ecosystems that they inhabit. Um, they create little dams in, in ponds, rivers, lakes, and that creates a a little um, ecosystem where other animals can come and live and you know they they have the ability to even change the microclimate in those areas and so they're very important species and so without them um you know different habitats would get affected in a in a bad way um here's a book that we we actually have our students read for our lsa program it's called Nature's Allies, Aid Conservationists Who uh, Changed the World by Larry Nielsen. And the book talks about um, eight people that were instrumental in, in basically changing the world and how it viewed um, conservation and the environment. And so if you, I think, um, Robert, you guys have a book club still? <laughs> this would be a good one. This would be a good one for them to read. Um, so just a, a little bit about Aldo Leopold, because he's considered um, worldwide, he's considered the father of wildlife ecology and conservation. Um, usually when you think of land stewardship, when you think of conservation, this is one of the, the giants that, that you think of. Um, he was an American writer, philosopher, naturalist, scientist, ecologist, forester, conservationist. He was a university professor and he's considered an environmentalist. He wrote several books, including his most famous one, which was a Sand County Almanac. Since he was a little boy, he spent a lot of time in nature. He um, documented in, in a lot of detail um, changes in weather, changes in um, you know, seasons, just uh, populations of birds, when they would nest, you know, just a lot of different things that he would just make a lot of observations in nature. And um, when we think of land stewardship, we we can kind of connect it to his land, what we what he called a land ethic. So basically what he thought was that when you're thinking of nature, think of yourself as not not the conqueror of nature, but a very integral part of nature. Um, and so he thought of a land ethic as a moral responsibility to care for the land and everything that's on it. And so it's it's kind of a, an understanding of people's relationship within within nature and a personal conviction to, to um, do what's right for the land, even though it might not be the most um, profitable, the most uh, economically feasible, 
um, thing for you to do, but doing what's right for the li for the land, even though um, with with uh, with having an understanding that it's for the the greater good, um, and that's kind of what guided his beliefs. So here's um here's another good book for your reading club. It's called the Stan County Almanac, and here's a couple of quotes from his book. He says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And another quote from his book says, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Okay, so so when we teach land stewardship to kids um, at the most basic, basic level, anybody can be a land steward um, anywhere. And so if you're at a national park or a state park, a park ranger or an interpreter can be the land steward. And their job is to, you know, guide people that visit the park and you know, point out different plants, different animals, and by educating the people about those plants and animals, it, it creates in them an understanding. And when you understand something, you care for it. And so that kind of makes them, you know, respect nature wherever they go. Um, of course, teachers have the ability to shape minds. Um, when you're, when you're a, a teacher of a, an elementary grade or even middle school and high school, you have those kids in front of you for hours throughout the day. And so by incorporating land stewardship in your teachings at that level, you know, that's part of being a good land steward, or maybe you have a garden, you know, in your, you know, outside of your classroom, maybe you are teaching them to grow bean seeds. The simplest thing, just creating life from a seed, that is being a land steward. Uh, of course, homeowners um, here in Texas, 95 to 97 percent of the land is privately owned, and so we have a lot of landowners. Um, and so it's important to reach out to them. It's important for those landowners to, you know, to learn, you know, what they can do to conserve the natural resources found on their land. Now they might not own the wildlife that lives on their land, but they do have a responsibility to take care of the land in which those wild animals live. Um, farmers, same thing. They have a plot of land. They grow crops on there. They basically produce food for people, um, but they also have a responsibility to do it in a responsible way. Um, and we'll talk about um, soil conservation in a little bit. Um, same thing with ranchers. Ranchers produce food for people. I work for the East Foundation. They have six ranches. They use those six ranches to create basically beef, to produce beef for people. Um, and so ranchers also have a responsibility to take care of the land, um, you know, by not allowing overgrazing, by making sure that the wildlife still have a place within, you know, that land, uh, even though it's used for grazing. And then, of course, um, you know, I work a lot with students, even students can be land stewards. A lot of the times when I go into classrooms, you know, when they hear the word land stewardship, it, it sounds very complicated, but, you know, it's very simple. If you, if you simply put out a bird feeder, or if you put out a little bowl of water, you know, for the birds, that's being a land steward. So. So, you know, to put it in context, everybody and anyone can be a land steward. So um, I want to start by talking a little bit about how land stewardship affects uh, the soil that we have. Um, one of the lessons that I teach at schools is, uh, is called stewarding soil. And uh, basically, I begin the lesson by talking about different products that we get from soil. Um, soil isn't simply sand, silt, and clay, which are basically the rock particles that we find in soil. 
Soil actually contains, you know, air and water, nutrients, um, microscopic organisms. You know, I always tell students, you know, that soil contains those little roly polies and ants and termites and earthworms. All of that is contained in our soil, and collectively, that that makes our, you know, our the substance that basically grows um, our plants, and. We can't think of soil as being separate from other things like water. Soil and water are separate. No, everything's connected together. Um, and so some of the things that we can do to take care of our soil is, um, I wrote a couple of, of things here. Overgrazing can lead to soil erosion, which gets rid of the healthy layer of topsoil needed to grow healthy crops and graze cattle. Um, Soil actually is kind of the basis of everything that um, that we have that we depend on. If you take a look around your room, you might see a wooden chair. A wooden chair, um, you know, the wood came from a tree, right? And the tree was grown in the soil. Without the soil, you probably wouldn't have a tree. Um, your clothing, like if you're wearing something made out of cotton, Cotton is a fiber that grows on a plant. The plant grows in the soil. Therefore, maybe we wouldn't have cotton if we didn't have soil. So those things make us realize the importance of soil. So right away, you know, furniture, like without wood, maybe we wouldn't even have homes, right? So soil, you know, produces our shelter. It produces some of the clothing that we wear. So that's another one of our basic needs. And our food, not to mention our food. Our food comes from plants that grow in the soil. So definitely it is in our best interest to conserve our soil. Um, proper ranch management can prevent overgrazing. So something that, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't um, growing up, I always lived in the city and I wasn't exposed to um, agriculture uh, until I basically got this job with uh, with the East Foundation. And so um, something that I learned over time is that there's something called rotational grazing so that um, you're rotating your cattle to different pastures so that, um, you know, when you move them from pasture to pasture, the pasture that they were on before gets to recover and then they graze in a different pasture. So this is one way that they prevent overgrazing. And of course, your ratio of animals also makes a difference. And this is what makes the East Foundation unique is that they're actually doing research on, um, you know, stocking rates and they have the land to be able to uh, do demonstration areas. Um, I think their demonstration areas are the Coloraditas um, demonstration area. And I'm pretty sure you can find information about that on our website. It's, it's like a long term study that they're doing um, where they have different stocking rates on on the pastures and they can see, you know, what ratios are better for the health of the soil, the health of the plants. Uh, the vegetation, the, you know, when it grows back, they also do controlled burns in certain areas um, to get rid of the monoculture of um, grasses that we have, especially in Port Mansfield, we have a lot of cord grass, that Spartina grass, that's really, really thick. And so um, over time, that Spartina grass gets really thick and it's, it becomes unpalatable to, to cattle and they no longer can graze from it. So what they do is they, they do a controlled burn, they get rid of the Spartina grass, and what comes out after is these really tender shoots that, that are very palatable to the, to the cows. And also an effect of that is they get rid of all of that monoculture, that, that really bunched up grass, so that it gives the opportunity for other native plants to grow in its place and that actually increases the biodiversity of, um, of the plants that are there at, in that location. So, you know, part of being a good land steward is managing those, um, those uh, monocultures of plants or 
um, you know, managing the way that you rotate your herd so that they don't overgraze. Um, farming techniques can be implemented as well, such as using cover crops. So when you're not growing corn, you know, make sure that you have a crop that actually covers your ground um, so that you prevent overgrazing. I'm sorry, not overgrazing, so that you can prevent um, erosion. Um, erosion, of course, happens when wind or water, you know, carries away that topsoil. And that's definitely something that you don't want if you're a farmer. You don't want to get rid of that topsoil. That topsoil layer actually contains a lot of organic nutrients, organic matter that's being broken down. And so when you have a cover crop, um, that cover crop not only keeps the soil in place, but once that cover crop dies out, it returns some of those nutrients back to the soil. Drip irrigation is another technique that um, not only conserves water, but it conserves the soil um, because you're not, um, you're preventing the compaction of the soil. When you flood an area, when you flood the, um, the field with water, it kind of makes the, the soil compacted and it makes it hard and it makes it hard for plants to, to kind of spread out their roots. Um, reducing tillage. So by not disturbing the ground too much, you're conserving the nutrients in there and you're preventing erosion as well. And of course, planting a variety of crops can also prevent uh, nutri uh, nutrient depletion. When you plant one single crop year after year after year after year, that crop is going to continue to using to be using the same types of nutrients over and over again, and that's going to deplete your soil. So by using a wide variety of different crops from um, overusing that particular nutrient, like cotton. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so also reducing um, pesticides, the, reducing the use of pesticides on your soil, on your on your crops. That's not only going to benefit the soil, but also the water. Sometimes if we if we overuse pesticides, when it rains, some of those pesticides can wash into our waterways, uh, into our canals, and from the canal it goes into a river, and from the river it ends up all the way into the ocean. Um, and it also, you know, reducing pesticide use can also um, benefit pollinators. Yeah, reducing fertilizers, of course, can benefit soil too. I was reading an article that said that some fertilizers actually get rid of the carbon in in the soil, and and that's not good for the microorganisms that benefit from from that carbon. So definitely, um, one way to um, you know to take care of our soil is reduce pesticides, reduce fertilizers, and and so yes, like. If the fertilizers wash into the water, you can get a big algal bloom. You, um, I don't know if you guys have ever read about the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. That's because, you know, there's a lot of um, agricultural runoff from um, mainly from the Mississippi River where they have a lot of, you know, um, runoff that goes into the Gulf of Mexico. And, and so all that algae, you know, there's, a, there's an explosion of algae and then that algae, you know, when it starts to die off, the bacteria start to decompose it, and that actually sucks up all the oxygen from the water, and then nothing can live there because the the water is is depleted of oxygen. So, there are local organizations, or actually nationwide, there's um, people from AgriLife and people from NRCS that can provide um, science-based recommendations for your land if, if you are a farmer or if you're a rancher. Um, so how does land stewardship affect our water? So everybody that's in this meeting lives on a watershed. And um, anybody that lives anywhere is part of a watershed. So a watershed is basically an area of land that um, when it rains, it sheds its water into a particular body of water. So it could be a lake, a river, um, you know, even the, the bay that we have nearby. 
So what we do on our land can have an impact on the quality of water that ends up in the body of water. So um, we, we do have two watersheds that I don't know where everybody lives in, in this meeting, but you either, um, you're either part of the Arroyo Colorado watershed or you're part of the Rio Grande watershed. And the way that we can, um, you know, prevent a negative impact on the quality of our rivers or in the Bay or maybe in the Arroyo Colorado is, is by doing simple things, you know, um, don't litter. And if you see trash outside, pick it up, even if it wasn't you who threw that trash. Um, a lot of the trash that ends up on our beach is actually coming from miles and miles and miles away from cities. Um, and a lot of people don't realize, maybe they think, oh, well, the beach goers deposited all this trash. But in reality, it's basically coming from neighborhoods that are miles and miles away. Um, and so, yeah, all that litter, all that plastic, all of that debris um, coming from cities, it enters the sewer system, travels the canals, from the canal goes into the river, from the river it goes into the ocean. Um, and also, of course, reduce your use of pesticides and fertilizers on your lawns, because again, when it rains, that runoff can carry away um, those pesticides and fertilizers. And very importantly, always have a wide variety of native plants and vegetation on your land, because that's going to, of course, benefit native wildlife, but also it's going to reduce the erosion on your land. And of course, pick up pet, pet waste. Um, a lot of times after a big rain or a big storm, there's bacteria levels in the ocean that are very high and that bacteria can be E. coli. And that E. coli can only come from the guts of mammals. And that's more than likely it's, you know, pet waste that is being washed into our sewers, um, you know, from neighborhoods. So definitely, if you take your, your pet out for a walk, make sure you have those little baggies to pick up their pet waste. Our local watershed, you may, you may be part of this watershed, you may not. Um, so the Arroyo Colorado starts uh, in Mission and it goes through the Rio Grande Valley and it goes all the way to Arroyo City and it empties out over there at Adolf Tome um, Park. And um, it's basically, uh, you know, our local watershed. So we can have a negative impact or we can have a positive impact on the quality of water that ends up in the Arroyo Colorado. Um, there are scientists that monitor the quality of water in the Arroyo Colorado. Um, the quality of water has improved over time um, because there's, you know, systems in place that that um that will prevent some of the runoff that goes into the arroyo from from being um, polluted here's the um, rio grande watershed and so the rio grande starts all the way in colorado in the mountains of colorado it goes through new mexico and here it forms the border between um you know mexico and the united states in the the texas border and uh, again, you know, we, we can, as land stewards, we can have a positive impact on the quality of water that ends up in the, in the Rio Grande. And of course the Rio Grande, um, the mouth of the river is here in Brownsville, Boca Chica Beach. Um, if you've never been there, it's really cool. I haven't been here there in, in quite a while. I don't know if the river is actually reaching the beach. Does anybody know if it's reaching the the ocean? I've been I've been to the mouth of the river when the um, the river hasn't even reached it because it, the water level was so low. Okay, so I'm I'm seeing yes. So it is going all the way to the ocean, and that's good. So here's a quote from Aldo Leopold. It says, "Soil and water are not two systems, but one. Both are organs of a single landscape. A derangement of in either affects the health of both. 
So, you know, we just talked about soil, we talked about water, but they're not separate. They're, you know, they're kind of intertwined. Um, you know, when one system is out of whack, it kind of affects the other system. So how land stewardship affects wildlife? Um, well, if you if you practice land stewardship, if you um, create habitat for wild animals, you're going to increase biodiversity. Um, if you are a good land steward, there's going to be an increase in healthy habitat. Now, what does healthy habitat mean? Well, it means a wide variety of plants, a wide variety of animals, not just a mon monoculture of you know, palm trees or mesquite trees, even though mesquite trees are native, you know, um, if you just have a, a monoculture of mesquite trees, that's not really going to be, you know, the ideal habitat because there's only one type of tree. So a wide variety of trees is, is more beneficial than, you know, just having one type. Um, land stewardship means clean water for aquatic organisms. Um, we talked about how we all live in a watershed, um, but if there's a lot of pollution going into the ocean, that's going to affect aquatic animals um, because that's their home. We have a very fragile ecosystem here in the Laguna Madre. We have, um, we have seagrasses, and those seagrasses are really, really important because they are one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. They um, provide nursery habitat for crabs, fish, shrimp. Um, you know, the, the seagrasses actually provide food for sea turtles. Uh, the seagrasses themselves help to um, keep the sand in place and therefore um, they create uh, oxygen for the animals that live in the water and they absorb the carbon dioxide that's, um, that's in the water too. So they are a really, really important part of our um, ecosystem here. And uh, we do have oysters that, that live in the water too. Um, without without um, the, the good water quality that, that they need, they are not going to thrive. So another thing that, um, that is part of land stewardship is controlling invasive plants and invasive animals. Um, I'll give a couple of examples of invasive um, plants. We have a plant called um, the Brazilian pepper that I see along um, waterways. That one is really, really invasive. It takes over a lot of the habitat that belongs to the native plants. Um, let's see, castor bean plant, I see that as well. These are just some examples of, of invasive plants um, that are kind of taking over. They have the ability to take over. Um, invasive animals, a perfect example are feral hogs. Um, you know, they are, they are a big pest here in Texas and they destroy, you know, crops. They, they take over the habitat that belongs to the native animals. They, um, they negatively impact the quality of water in ponds, local ponds, rivers. Um, and so it's, you know, it's an animal that, again, was brought over from Europe a long time ago, like in the 1500s. And since then, it has kind of spread out throughout uh, the United States. And, and now, you know, it's basically a battle against uh, those feral hogs. Uh, just in case you don't know, you can hunt feral hogs all year long. There's no limit. Uh, you do have to, of course, have your hunting license for that, but it's open season all year long. There's no limit for feral hogs. Don't confuse them, though, with um, javelinas. Javelinas are, are native, and so they, um, you know, they there's a limit of two per hunter per season. And so I, I didn't see the question. Barbara, can you look at the chat and tell me the question that was brought up? Can you comment about the armored catfish that has exploded in the area? Right, armored catfish, um, those are from the pet trade. And um, what happens is people buy them, you know, as tiny little sucker fish that they put in their tank 
and um, they eat the algae from the tank and they keep your tank clean, but they do grow, they get really big. And once they get too big, people decide, you know what, I don't know what to do with this fish anymore. It's too big for my tank. And so they go and dump it in the resacas. The reason that's bad is because they're out competing um, the native fish for habitat, but they also, they tend to make these, um, I guess they kind of dig themselves little burrows along the banks of uh, the resacas. And what happens then is that um, they start to degrade the the embankments of the resacas. And so you start to have a lot of erosion. And when you have erosion in the resacas, they start to fill in. They start to fill in with a lot of sediments. And um, and then you don't have the depth that, that you had before. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that kind of answered the question. Was there another comment in there? Yeah, I was saying that they used to only be found in the in freshwater in the Rusakas, but um, you can find them in the bays. They're probably in the Gulf as well, and they're they um, they reproduce uh, like crazy. And I was wondering if there's any measures being taken to do anything about them. They certainly couldn't be beneficial uh, to the to our um, our balance we have down here. I didn't know that they were spreading into the um, into the saltwater ecosystems as well. Um, I don't know of any any measures that are being taken. Um, I don't know if Kelly, you know of any measures that are being taken against these catfish. Um, I've I've not heard that. Um, I can definitely reach out to my fr friends in um, the fishery division, um, but all of the the information we've been sent has all been the impacts in freshwater. Um, but if that's what you're seeing out there, um, it's good for our ears to hear so we can pass that along. Yeah, last trip to, to Port Mansfield was uh, after the 20, was it 2020 or 21 freeze mm -hmm. in February? Uh, the banks were littered with them. So evidently they're, they're sensitive to cold, which kind of was a good thing. But the bank was just covered in the section I was walking in everywhere. I, I happened to stop and try a spot. They were all over the place. And I was in Mansfield, so I guess they got through got there through um the Arroyo. And they seemed like alive and healthy or like slowly but surely dying. This is Tony. They they could have washed out of some of the freshwater areas. I think what is it the seven mile um, seven mile creek or whatever and out of Port Mansfield, but they do not they do not live in salt water. Right. Thank you for those comments. I, it's certainly something that to be concerned about anytime you have these um, invasive species that are um, affecting uh, other wildlife. And on the East Foundation Ranch, we do have, um, especially in Port Mansfield, we do have the uh, Nilgai antelope, which is another one that's um, you know pretty common uh, in South Texas. Those are also sensitive to cold weather, um, but you know they're just such large animals that you know they don't really have natural predators around. Um, and so they, you know, they kind of spread out, but, you know, it's kind of like a love hate relationship that ranchers have with Nilgai antelope. They like them because they're money makers. Um, a lot of people would pay a lot of money for um, hunting one of these Nilgais and they, you know, they taste delicious, but they are carriers of the cattle fever tick and so um, the East Foundation does manage for those uh, invasive species of Nilgai. Uh, and so it's just part of being a land steward, you know, just um, managing your wildlife, um, you know, so that you can have uh, a healthy ecosystem of native um, plants and animals. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, organizations that can help you um, if you are a landowner 
and you, you know, want to increase your biodiversity at on your land. There's Texas Parks and Wildlife. There's um, Texas Wildlife Association, uh, Las Huellas locally, uh, NRCS, AgriLife. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different organizations that you can reach out to. And these are just a few. I'm I'm pretty sure there's so many others, um, but. You know, if you need help to manage or enhance your your land for wildlife habitat, you can reach out. Um, and just remember that wildlife includes plants and animals, not just animals um, that normally don't have a caretaker. So these are different than domestic animals, which you know we we provide care to. So like cattle, horses, sheep, pigs, goats, those are domestic. But wildlife includes you know the plants and animals that don't have caretakers. They find their own food. They find their own water. They have to seek their own shelter. Those are the ones that are that need our, our help the most. Um, so part of being a good land steward is also using your voice and, and your vote. Um, so if you know that, you know, there's a certain law that's going to be passed, that's going to affect you know, um, anything in natural resources, which it, whether it's, you know, the plants or the animals or hunting rights or, you know, anything like that, you do have the power to contact your, whether it's local or state or federal officials, um, you know, that's their duty to listen to your, to their constituents, um, opinions and, and voices. And, you know, use that power to also, you know, be a land steward. So this is for the protection of, you know, the land, water and the wildlife in your area or, you know, throughout the, the nation as well. Um, currently, there's a lack of diversity in the natural resource conservation field in general. Um, there needs to be more people of color. There needs to be more females, minority groups, we need to include everybody in the discussion because this ultimately, you know, conservation and land stewardship should be something that everyone is concerned about. Everyone needs natural resources in their lives. There's no way of getting around it. Everybody needs natural resources. So Anybody in any ethnicity, culture, religion, et cetera, can be a land steward. And I just wanted to, to include that in there because, um, you know, as, as part of being an instructor, instructor for the land stewardship ambassador program, this is some, this is a topic that we, that we touch on, um, that we need to be inclusive and that we need to encourage, um, you know, minorities to, to participate in these discussions. Um, how can you be a land steward? Um, here's another book that I recommend. Um, it's called The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature. And it's basically um, the story of, of the author. Basically, it's, it's him. He's talking about his childhood, how he would spend um, a lot of time outdoors in South Carolina. And he, um, you know, he pays tribute to his family's homestead and um, you know, his, his grandmother, his parents that were school teachers. And it's basically him talking about his love of nature, his, uh, you know, how nature is beautiful and basically his, um, you know, his experiences as a, as a colored man, as a black man, um, you know, how, you know, even though he was different and it, in, in his social world wasn't very common for him to, you know, for a black man to be, you know, a birder, for example, or somebody that's spending time in nature that wasn't very common for him. And so he talks about those experiences as being a black man that loves nature. So it's a, it's a really good, um, it's a really good book. I do recommend it for your, um, for your book club. <laughs> okay, so to, to kind of um, bring it all together, um, what can ordinary people do to be land stewards? So even if you're not a landowner, you can still be a land steward. And this is what I tell students all the time. Um, I encourage them to start thinking about this at a young age because, you know, they are the future landowners of Texas. They are 
the future voters of Texas. And so, you know, these are the things that I normally tell students that they can do because, you know, at that age there, they're probably not landowners, but maybe their parents, their grandparents, their uncles, cousins, teachers, you know, they are the landowners of, of Texas. And so it, pretty soon they will become adults. Um, so practice the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. I think the first R is probably the most important one. Um, we live in a throwaway society where we use things once and then we get rid of them or we use, you know, we um, use a lot of plastic. I'm not saying that I don't because I do and I'm guilty. Um, we probably all are, but reducing our use of especially those one time use plastics that end up, you know, in the landfill. We only use them once we throw them away. Um, reducing our basically our consumerism, you know, we, we buy a lot of stuff that we don't need. And so the first R is really important. And if you do buy stuff, you know, try to use it more than once. So that's the reuse part of it and recycle, you know, um, depending on where you live, you may or may not have a recycling center. Um, but there's a lot of things you can recycle, um, paper, plastic, aluminum, glass, cardboard, uh, a lot of things. Plant native trees and plants. Um, this is really important because um, this ultimately is what's going to benefit the native wildlife. When you have those relationships, you know, evolutionarily speaking, the native plants are used to using, um, or sorry, vice versa, native animals are used to using those native plants. If you introduce a plant that they're not familiar with, you know, you can't expect them to change overnight and, you know, start using an introduced plant. Um, so it's important to use native plants and trees. They are also more resistant to um, weather conditions. You know, here in South Texas, it's really hot, it's really dry. Uh, and so you want those plants to be, um, you know, able to survive those conditions. Growing your own food also reduces your carbon footprint. Um, if you have a garden at home, you are basically um, cutting out the transportation, you know, the carb, the, you know, the CO2 emissions, you know, that, that it took to transport your food from who knows what country all the way to your store. And then you go and get it in your car to the store and then to back to your home. So if you grow your own food, it's, you know, where it's coming from. Um, you know, it's, it lessens your carbon footprint and you're also, um, maybe you're growing it organically. Maybe you're not using as many pesticides or fertilizers as, you know, a normal, um, I guess, farmer would, uh, if you, you know, practice don't litter, you know, you're, you're picking up trash from outside where it doesn't belong. Um, one of the presentations that I do a lot is um, called birds of a feather and I have some, you know, bird nests that I show the students and within the bird nests, there's um, man made uh, materials in the bird nest, like fishing line or string or uh, sometimes I see plastic pieces of plastic bags in between the little, um, you know, the nest and it, it's kind of sad because somebody did not pick up their trash. They didn't dispose of their trash properly. Um, donate to organi organizations that are working to conserve nature. There's a ton of them. Um, practice safe, legal, ethical, and sustainable hunting and fishing. Provide habitat for native wildlife, um, especially in your own home, or, you know, if you have a, um, a kid or a grandkid in your house, Encourage them to encourage their teacher to maybe, you know, start a little garden at school. It's very, very, um, it's, it's very valuable for students to get hands on and get their hands dirty in the dirt and grow things. It's amazing. Um, bird bath, bird feeder, bad house. If you can install these in your house, you know, that's part of being a land steward. Compost, you know, don't throw your your kitchen scraps in the trash. You know, um, they can ma be making soil for you outside. Reduce your use of pesticides and fertilizers on your lawns. And very importantly, educate others about what you know um, and encourage people to 
to practice these things um, in their everyday life. So yeah, that was my presentation about land stewardship. I hope I got the message across. <laughs> oh, you absolutely did. You gave us a lot to think about. Um, one question that um, came up at the end of your presentation, what is the role of the Valley Land Fund in terms of stewardship? Um, I, I'm not sure, but I think that they, don't they purchase land for conservation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I think that's what I they do. do. I can, I can hop in too a little bit. Um, they also play a really vital and important role of helping landowners set up um, conservation easements on their property. Um, you know, not every acre can be purchased, but just like Elise was saying, if you can convince that landowner to protect their own property and a conservation easement is held in perpetuity, um, that's, that's just an amazing way to protect habitat for forever. Thanks, Kelly. Good question and um, great explanation. Anybody else? I really encourage you to uh, get involved with Elisa's programs. Um, it they, you know, Port Mansfield's not right around the corner from the island or anything, but it is like going up there. She's got it all planned out. Tells you what to do hands you the boxes and you, you know, work with the students and they are just like so excited, A, to be outside and B, to be in this hands-on learning. Is we loved it. So I really encourage you guys to, to get involved with uh, Elisa and the East Foundation. Barbara. Yes. I've got another comment. Um, Thomas, I looked up the the armored catfish and some in India can survive 12 parts per thousand. The only time the Laguna Madre has gone down to that was I think during 2010 when it when it dropped almost to zero for a few weeks. But the upper reaches of some of these tributaries that drain into the Laguna Madre could have that, I guess, that salinity. So there may be a possibility that some of them could have could have served or been surviving in the upper reaches, but that particular genus has not been documented here in the valley that I know of. So maybe you found something that's new. I'd like to see some of the species if you ever see it again, because you may have discovered something that we're not aware of. Thank you. I'll, next time I see one, I'll take a pic, uh, a couple of pictures and share them. I could probably collect one too and save it, freeze it and save it. That'd be great. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for that comment, Tony. And thanks for Tom, bring us your pictures. And Elisa, thank you for spending the evening with us. And, and I think at least since I've known, we have not, uh, had land stewardship as one of our chapters, and I think you did a fantastic job. And it may we may have a question from Joyce. Joyce, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to unmute. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Um, are there can be are there any programs that can be shared like outside the state of Texas? I was game center on site and a teacher from Minnesota asked if there were any pro programs that I didn't know. Robert records them and they're found on YouTube, right, Barbara? Yes, I mean our our talks are, but are you talking about like this same kind of thing for other states? Yes. I know that other For states like that. have mass, master nationalist programs. I don't know which all the states that do, but I know it's something that, that Texas recommend. is not the only, what, only one. That, 
yeah, I I would look into that because that's recommended that you look for in her. Excellent. You're already learning. Excellent. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of different organizations in different states that that do similar things that some of the organizations here in Texas do. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Excellent talk, well, Elisa. I learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Thanks for having and, me. Oh, absolutely. We loved having you. Um, always good to see my classmates. And Tony was going, he, he stayed the whole time. So, hey, now you have to stay for the next one, Tony. So, I'm not sure. I've got to write this report and it's like a week late. <laughs> I'll try. Okay. Okay. You try. And th thanks, Elisa. And um, we hope we hope we can make it up to Port Mansfield soon to join you and help you out. I'd like, I, I'd love to have any of you and Barbara and Robert, thank you so much for helping me in the past. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. So I, I um, highly recommend for you guys to volunteer. It's a good way to spend your day. Elisa, you're going to host us during the eclipse next October, right? Yes, during the conference, TMN conference. So the state conference, everybody put their, that on their calendar. What date is it, Barbara? Uh, Robert, it's the October 12th through 15th or something like that. And the day they're planning on going to El Sal's is Saturday, I believe. And then be there for activities, eat lunch, and then view the eclipse. So no clouds. Even if there's clouds, you can see the birds starting to go back to their to where their roosting areas. It's I've been in one during an e eclipse and it was cloudy and it's amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, very good. And I'm sure Elisa and the El Sal's Ranch will be a great host. Okay, it's time to get started. Are you there, Kellyanne? Yes. Oh, I was like, oh, she left. I didn't. I just was struggling. <laughs> That's okay. You saw how I've struggled. Okay, it looks like. Right, Robert's already made you the uh, presenter. Let me share. Share and then. Right. Slideshow from the beginning. All okay. right. So I'm in it. I have a short introduction. Perfect. Yep. Kelly M. Malkowski is the park superintendent at Resaca de la Palma State Park. She uh, got her start with Texas Parks and Wildlife as a park interpreter educator at LBJ State Park in Stonewall, Texas, and later moved to Resaca de la Palma. She's currently as a park superintendent, she strives to maintain both a unique landscape and create outdoor opportunities for folks living in the RGV. Outside of work, she enjoys time spent outdoors with her family and loves a good true crime podcast. So yes. now you know about Kelly. Welcome, Kelly, and take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me and having me again since y'all came out to my park not too long ago. Um, I'm going to be doing a presentation on neat facts and drought impacts since I used some of my normal presentation content when you were actually on site and I wanted to um, provide something uh, a little more fresh than just a repeat of what you maybe already heard me say. However, um, Elisa's presentation and mine dovetail together. So um, there are gonna be a couple of topics and concepts that are revisited, but they are gonna be more dialed into my site uh, specifically. Um, 
I really like questions. So if you have questions while I'm talking, feel free. Um, hopefully somebody can can moderate. So if those are popping up in the chat, I can't really see them. Um, or you can come off of mute and ask them while I'm talking. Uh, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, I have 30 slides. I was like, okay, Kelly, two minutes per slide, but I'm an incredibly fast talker. So um, your questions help slow me down. And um, if I get through my content too quick, I'm more than happy to answer any miscellaneous questions that you might have um, to make sure that you're getting all of your credit. So why are you not transitioning? Um, technical difficulty. There we go. I have a lag. Sorry. So we're going to start with our neat facts. And we're going to go from big to small. So um, in my thinking, we start wide out and then we'll dial in both on our neat facts and then our drought impacts. So this is the eco region map. Um, I imagine a lot of you have had the opportunity to take a peek at that. Um, I like this one because the colors are really, really vibrant. But my park in Brownsville, Texas, um, we fall in the South Texas Plains. More specifically, the lower Rio Grande Valley and my park, um, we're in an alluvial floodplain ecoregion. Um, that's just a really fancy way of saying we're adjacent to the river, and when it floods, we get some cool silty deposits um, brought into our, our habitat and into the landscape. So there's some specific forest types that um, I'm going to spend some time map the more the populations are um, this one is actually for um, thorn scrub habitat we specifically have camelip and thorn scrub habitat but as you look in that map there's other places in texas that have thorn scrub um, they're just not camelip and thorn scrub so as you can see like right where that sea is on cameron um, we have some pretty good remnant tracks of camelip and thorn scrub um, I'm going to talk about mixed mesquite shrublands, and then, of course, my favorite, ebony and aqua woodlands. So here's the park. Um, I couldn't remember if I did this in my introduction or not, so I just figured I'd run over it one more time since it's pretty quick. Um, the park is 1,200 acres of land that the state owns. This is not a leased property. Um, we are flanked by 200 acres of U.S. Fish and Wildlife land. Um, the approach for that is no human access, so that 200 acres is solely for the benefit of the wildlife. Um, it's managed a little bit differently than the rest of the park because, of course, in that 1,200 acres, uh, we, pro we provide public access. And then our wetland habitat that ribbons through the park is about 65 acres. So a part of my, um, my journey and being uh, a public educator and a park interpreter and now a park superintendent, um, almost 10 years of my life at this point in time, is creating the connection between people and the landscape. So who lives here? Who's going to utilize my site? Um, there's almost 200,000 residents in Brownsville. Uh, the 2022 data hasn't been released yet, but that's what the trend is towards. Um, and 80% of them do not have easy access to green spaces or parkland. Um, just like in the previous presentation, if folks don't have access to the site, if they don't have exposure to the site, it is hard for them to build um, a love and an understanding for the landscape. I searched high and low for it. There's um, a habitat fragmentation map that I could not find that I saw in another presentation, um, but you could almost layer it over our near road environments in Brownsville. So a citation for the stat. Um, I pulled that off of, I have all of my resources cited on my resource slide. Um, if you wouldn't have asked that question, I would have remembered, but I pulled it off of, it's either censusdata.org or when we get there, we'll circle back and I'll show you where I got, got the information from. Um, As I was saying, so not only are our major roadways impacting um, folks' humans' abilities to get to these green spaces, is also preventing wildlife from moving from place to place. So when you um, look at this map, you can find the park. Um, we're more in the green blob with the blue on top of us. So there's like a little square 
um, and that's where we are. So we're on the, the northern side. Um, the contrast could have been a little bit better. So what lives here? What lives in my park? Um, so there's plants and wildlife that call the park home. Um, these are two of our fan favorites and they are dependent upon each other. So the top one is a, a baby Texas tortoise. There's nothing in there for scale, but it was, I could like wrap my, my fingers around it like this. It was definitely um, a fresh hatch. And then of course they really, really like to um, eat those prickly pear cactuses. So interestingly enough, I saw that question. Um, we have not seen any armored catfish in the park. Uh, a lot of that has to do with how we manage the Rasaka itself. Um, but there have been no armored catfishes. I've got to go to the reservoir two or three times with um, summer camp groups to fish it. It's one of the few times that anybody actually gets to fish it. They give us a little bit of private access uh, and that's all the kids caught. And that's all we saw were armored catfish. We didn't catch anything else except for those armored cats. So these are trees common to tamaleaf and thorn scrub. Um, these are trees that if you were out and about, um, I would hope that you would be able to identify for folks. Um, and that's a wisache, wyacon. Um, I threw blue scrubby sage in there just because I love it so much. Uh, kidney wood or um, that black brush acacia. For things that had more, like another common name, I put them in there, but some of them have like eight or nine or 10 or 12 common names, both in English and in Spanish. So that can be a little bit tricky when you're getting to know um, South Texas landscapes and plant communities because someone might say, oh, an ebono, and I'm like, an ebony or a Texas ebony or an ear bean tree, which I've heard it called one time and then verified on the internet. So who likes to live in that thorn scrub? Um, on the right is one of the most charismatic animals of deep south texas um that's a cute picture of an ocelot from a report i found from the 70s that was actually very very informative and on the right is thorn scrub in the park um as you can see my pictures from before were just individual trees uh, and i wanted them to be independent and on their own but in this photo they are cram jammed together so when there are reforestation projects and they're reforesta reforesting specifically tamaleaf and thorn scrub, they're shooting for 500 individual plants per acre. When in reality, what you actually find when you do the counts um, in old growth native habitat is a thousand plants per acre. So that ocelot over there likes a canopy density of 95% or more. And there are just very few tracks and chunks of habitat left. Um, the park, our last confirmed sighting was in 1972. We have not had a confirmed sighting of an ocelot in the park since then. Um, and even then, I'm a little bit skeptical because what counted as confirmed in the 70s is very different than what we count um, as a confirmed sighting now in 2023. We would want DNA, um, a dead one, poop, something to actually physically show environmental DNA. We took a swab from a paw print as opposed to, yes, we saw one here. Um, and that and that counted. So plants of um, mesquite shrublands. So of course, mesquite is in the name. Um, so honey mesquite, that's one of the most commonly cited tree species in our park. They're incredibly common through the whole state of Texas. Um, much of their migration can be laid at the, the hands of humans. Um, but on top is a much more rare mesquite type, and that's a screw bean mesquite. And these are important um, as a food plant for blue metamark butterflies. And we have really robust populations of these screw bean mesquites. And that's why this part can generally be a pretty good site to find those blue metamark butterflies. Um, a honey mesquite, gonna get big and tall and broad. A screw bean mesquite, they're, they're tiny. They're very, very small. They have those very, very distinctly curled um, seed pods. So who likes to live there? Who's gonna utilize that habitat? So when we talked about tamaleaf and thorn scrub, we're cram jammed in there. It's an incredibly um, high density of plant matter. When we get over to our ebony and uh, our mesquite woodlands, it's more open. So it's gonna be categorized as a lower density um, of tree canopy and tree cover. And that's important for our friends on the bottom. So that's a little bobwhite quail. Um, for Sacadella Palma, sadly, is not good quail habitat. We were um, inundated with non-native grasses and some invasive species. 
In my five years in this park, I've seen two coveys of quail, probably eight individual birds. For anybody that's into quail, that's next to nothing. That's almost no quail birds. And then on top, those are Nilgai antelopes. Those are two bulls. So again, with their size, um, they kind of like that more open habitat. They're going to be taking advantage of the other trees and plants you'd find in this habitat. So we can think about forests sort of like a blanket. Things aren't necessarily clearly delineated and mutually exclusive. So you're going to find some mesquites in your tamalip and thorn scrub, and you're going to find some ebony trees in your mesquite um, shrublands. All of these habitats are interconnected. Um, the density of the forest type can help us determine where exactly we're at. So are those trees um, on top of each other, or are they more sparse and wide apart? If they are more sparse and wide apart, that's going to attract different wildlife to those areas. So that little quail bird, um, it needs to be able to run on the ground and flee. A mesquite tree is a nursery. It's the grocery store and some parts of the year, it's the house. So as much as that tree gets a, a lot of hate because it can be problematic at times, um, it's really important to those. And it's a species that I really hope to invigorate in the park through some thoughtful um, management practices that we're implementing in the park. Neil guy we see on occasion. Um, we've had a cow who's been hanging around in the park. They are communal poopers. So they all poop in one big pile. Uh, that's how you can kind of guesstimate if you have a lot or a little and we barely ever see just like little bits here and there. So we know we don't have a robust population. So my favorite, ebony and aqua woodlands. Um, there is something so magical about walking through an ebony and aqua old growth forest. Like to me, it's comparable to visiting an old library or a grand old church. Um, it's such a rare habitat. So to be able to walk through an experience, that's the one thing that I want every visitor in the park to at least stand under one ebony tree for one second. Um, and we've helped meet our mission. <clears throat> Ebony trees, though, um, they can be a little bit pushy. They can be a little bit mean. They like their friends, and they don't often like anybody else. So if they're in a forest, you tend to see them with anaqua trees. You tend to see them with um, some hackberries. They're really pretty tolerant of flowering plants. So when you walk along the edges of ebony forest, you can see things like um, scarlet sage or blue mist flower. They're just not big fans of other big trees that are going to... Um, crowd their crowns they want their own crown space and they will poison the ground to ensure that they have it who lives there these are two of the most charismatic birds that we have in the park um, of course one is a great kiskadee and the other is a green jay um, these photos came from ebird i did not take them so i cannot claim them um, but they were better than any of the ones i had on my phone <coughs> so Ebony and aqua woodlands tend to do the best when they are adjacent to a water source here in the park. That's a Rasaka. Our oldest growth um, is all along the Rasaka corridor from that first picture I showed you of the park itself. Um, the first bird is a great kiskadee, and the second bird is a green jay, a member of um, the jay family, like with blue jays and scrub jays and mountain jays. So where we have those trees, we also tend to have some sort of water resource. Those water resources are then attracting insects, and that's what these two birds like to eat. Green jays are fairly opportunistic. They're going to eat seeds. Um, they might get in a trash can too here or there. Uh, <coughs> all right, and then we have that wetland habitat. So uh, I just picked two because I thought that these were, were interesting species to talk about. So on the right, we have zarza or sensitive plant. Um, so this is a plant that has a neat adaptation where you touch the leaves, they curl in on themselves. Um, I've heard most commonly the reason for that response um, is to move water down a stem to the base of the plant. They make a really pretty pink flower that's super good for a lot of our pollinators. Uh, they are very pushy though. So this is a plant without thoughtful and intensive management will completely choke out any sort of waterway. Uh, we intensively manage the Zarza in our Rasakas, intensively manage them in various sections of the park because they are not a do-nothing species. They are a turn your back and they are 12 feet tall and full of ants and very large painful spines that hook into your skin and when you pull them out you bleed a lot. 
On the right, we have a Montezuma cypress. Montezuma cypresses used to be incredibly common in Brownsville. If you go back and you dig into some of like the historic records, um, you'll hear people like they're talking about chopping them down and using them for all of the things we like to use wood for. Um, we do not have any original Montezumas left in the park. Every Montezuma we have um, was transplanted, transplanted into the park um, starting from about 2010 until now. So we have one individual that's already getting very, very big in stately. Um, it's sad though. So if you would have been in Brownsville in 1890, you would have been able to walk um, under these large, impressive stately trees. They're one of our few trees that actually lose their leaves in the fall. They go through a fall color change. Um, you're thinking like, oh no, they're dying. No, they're just losing their leaves, but their feet have to be wet. Um, and they can tolerate period of a period of dryness, but not ages and ages and ages of dryness. And they have to be fairly mature and well-developed to be able to tolerate that sort of heat stress. All right, who likes to live there? Um, the picture on the right was just like a little bit of a joke, but our Rasakas are non-moving bodies of water and they're also We're going to think about how long a wading bird's leg is, how long um, is a great blue heron. If it's much deeper than that, it's only really going to attract ducks. That shallower water resource um, is a great, great breeding ground for mosquitoes, uh, but that's also something um, that is an important part of our food chain here in the park. From those mosquitoes, you then get dragonflies. From those dragonflies, you get green jays, um, and it builds up so on and so forth, but it does increase a lot of human suffering. And then on the left is a Rio Grande Lesser Siren. Um, I've only seen two sirens in my five years, and it's because we were partnering with the university and they were doing a very cool study on environmental DNA, and they were verifying that their research methodology was correct. So they put out some traps and they happened to capture a couple, and they thought that two of them had died during that capturing process. Um, so they put them in a bucket and I was like, I would like to touch one. And the researcher let me, it wasn't dead y'all. I thought it was dead and it screamed because sirens are screamers and I screamed because it was really scary and I'm holding the siren and I don't know what to do. Um, so I gently put it back in the bucket, but they are both air gulpers. They have um, kind of a, a basic proto lung and they're also gill breathers. So they're able to do um, both depending on the nature of the resource. So if it's a low oxygen body of water, probably gonna be doing a little more air breathing. Um, if there's good levels of oxygen in the water, they're gonna be using those little frilly gills um, to get their oxygen. They have some front legs for kind of the crawling swimming activity, but no back legs. So I kind of think like if a newt and a salamander had a very, very slimy weird baby, that's a Rio Grande Lester siren. Okay, the thing that has been consuming me for the last three years of my life are droughts in the lower Rio Grande Valley and the impacts that they have on our natural resources, on our park operation, and on our visitor happiness and satisfaction. So we'll spend the next couple of minutes um, talking about some drought stuff, and this is where you're going to maybe see something that's a little more familiar. So I pulled this um, today off of the drought monitor. The data for February hasn't been released yet, but January was our 11th driest January for Cameron County and the 129 years that they've been keeping track of um, how wet we are. So it's been um, intermittent drought for a long time. Since about 2019, um, we've been feeling it and the park in various ways has been showing us. So right now, we're not technically in a drought, we're just abnormally dry. Um, it still feels like a drought, right? We, uh, we are 1.29 inches short for the year. So for January and February, um, we're, we're missing 1.29 inches. I saw a question pop up, but I didn't have enough time to read it. So if somebody wanted to read it to me, all I saw was algal blooms. I believe they were asking about the defense mechanism 
uh, of the trees when their leaves close in. What was that called again? Um, it's just it's just a drawing in. Um, so they're a sensitive plant. So when they're experiencing that um, that touch, it's either I've, I've read defense mechanism, but I'm not sure what they're really defending against because it wouldn't stop um, a wild animal from eating them. And then from observations, it doesn't seem like they're getting browsed on by very much, at least here at this park. Um, usually a better defense for plants is to taste bad. But the other research that I've read is that it is about moving water to a stem and then down to a root base so they can um, take advantage of water resources more. That's right. I remember the, the water part. And are all of those plants called sensitive plants? All broad, broad stroke. So um, again, tricky where plant names are, um, but I really don't want to have to repeat and learn 9,000 Latin names. So Zarza, Mimosa, um, black mimosa sensitive plant, anything in sort of the mimosa family gets interchangeably called all of those things. So we have um, native sensitive plants and then we have non-native to Texas sensitive plants that have been brought over from like Florida and California that people use as ornamentals. Um, so if you touch it and its leaves curl up and they tend to have very showy pink flowers, you're probably safe to call it a sensitive plant. I'll keep, I'll scoot you along. Okay. We have another question. Oh, yeah. Uh, with with non-moving water, do you experience al algae blooms? And how do you handle that? One of our ponds at H Hugh Ramsey Nature Park has, we, uh, uh, is getting, is covered with algae, so. experience that mostly because the water um, doesn't stay in the park for that long and a lot of the water is drawn up um, into plants. So we just don't have the amount of time necessary for the algal bloom to take place. Um, there are a couple of different like commercial options uh, some chemical treatments that can be used for algal blooms, but generally um, increasing the oxygen level can be helpful or just physically removing them. They make um, depends on what kind of algal, uh, like a particulate that you put in and then they bind and then it drops out and settles out. I know that's not probably the most helpful answer, but it's just not a problem that we've had so far in the park, or at least in the five years that I've been in here. So how do we get water into the park? Um, physically, the water comes into the park through a series of, of canals, um, but a little broader than that, Ideally, we would get some water through rainfall. So this is just our, our average for, um, for temperatures, both high and low, and then our average rainfall. Um, September was our, our wettest month of the year. Historically, it's generally been the wettest for the last two years. It hasn't really felt like that. It's felt like we've gotten a little bit more rain in October, um, but that doesn't always mean that that water is gonna make it in the park. So if we look at our hand, we can think of our hand as I have five little risacas, right? And then I have all of this space in between my fingers. So when we have a rain event, the rain has to fill up the space of my fingers and then come up and over into the risaca. And that is an absurd amount of water. Um, in 2018, the last big rain we had, the park flooded for, for six weeks. None of that water drained into the risaca. It settled on the landscape and absorbed into the plant life because it could not make it over the hump of the risaca banks because again, we're effluvial, so we're filling up, we're coming over our banks and we're spreading out. So every time we go through that process, we're adding another layer of silt on the top of the Risaka bed, bed edges. Um, so it makes it harder and harder and harder for any surface level rainwater to get back into our Risakas. Now a watershed map. So um, I'm really glad that y'all got to hear a lot about watersheds earlier. Um, this is my favorite tool to talk to people when they are frustrated about water and water resources in the park. So um, the two sections that have the most impact for us is the mint green and then the mustard yellow. So when I'm talking to folks and they're like, well, it rained, 
Um, more often than not, the watershed that that rainwater is going into is to the Arroyo. It's not draining into the Rio Grande. We need so much rain to fall on the other side of the river and the watershed that's on the Mexico side before it will ever actually um, have an impact for the park. So the mint is stuff that's north of Falcon. So we need it to rain north of Falcon Dam to fill up the reservoir, or if it rains south of Falcon, um, there's a mechanism called 1938 free water, and occasionally we might be able to access some of that free flowing water that's in the river itself. Again, I pulled today's just because I was hopeful, um, but Falcon Reservoir is only 13.3% full. And if you look at their long-term data, they've been under um, 500,000 acre feet in that reservoir for almost a year now. So when we get agricultural water, when we're buying water from a water a park, um, that water came from Falcon first. So if it's not making it into the watershed and it's not draining into the river and then ending up in Falcon Dam, there's almost nothing left for us because the it's a little bit of a tiered system based on your water right and your water allocation. And we are, um, we are lower down. So we are lower down on the tiers. We are not as important as municipal drinking water or as important as um, irrigating crops, even though to me it's super important because I wanna keep all of our wildlife safe, alive, healthy, going. So park impacts. What's happening to the park? Dry Rasaka beds. This is our most common customer complaint. This is our biggest um, issue in the park. On our north side, our north Rasaka, it has been 470 days since we've had the water resources um, and the ability to flood that section of the Rasaka. We um, break our 65 acre wetland up into two sections, the north end and the south end. We have been able to pump water in the south because our south Rasaka is narrower and deeper. So we lose less water to evaporation um, and we lose less water to seepage. And we lose less water to the plant sucking it up. Um, I really, I wish there was a simple solution. So if there was a simple solution or an easy solution, it would have already been solved. Um, I'm a really great, active, vigorous problem solver. I want things to be really wonderful in the park, but this has been a darn near impossible issue because we just don't have the rain. Um, in your classes, Sophia Garza, she was an intern for us last summer. And um, I don't think she ever got to see the Rosaka have any water in it. And that's heartbreaking to me that we hosted an intern and they didn't get to see the resource at its most effective. Um, so I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll have a wet year this year or we'll get a very manageable tropical storm or a, a very delicate um, Pat one hurricane in June, July, August. That All right, so because we don't have the water resources that we need for the park to really um, do well, we're seeing a lot of stress responses. So I look at the drought monitor and they say that we're just very dry, um, but I'm like, but the trees in the landscape tell me that we're in a drought. So on the left side, we have a, a panting bobcat. I just wanted that as like there are impacts to our mammals, right? It's really hot, it's really dry. There's nowhere in the park for them to find drinking water. Um, and then on the left are ebony trees. So two of them are in decent shape. The third one, I don't think will actually make it to summer. So I've been watching these three trees for almost a year now um, and watching them fluctuate through the heat stress. So at first, for about three months, I thought all three of them were dead and I was doing the twig test where I'm seeing like, what's the end of limb breakage? Is there any new budding? Um, are they gonna come back? And the far two did. I was really seeing some, some positive things out of them and I'm only five foot two, so I can only reach what I can reach, right? And the one on the far left, I was like, oh. Off of Mesquite Trail, um, that section of the park tends to look the worst for the Mesquite trees. Um, they were a part of a reforestation project. They didn't take well when they were reforested in the 70s, um, and they are not doing well through this latest heat stress drought cycle that we're going through. 
old growth, our old growth sections of ebony and aqua woodlands, the, the ones that are original to the park that have been, you know, standing and reforesting themselves since, you know, the early 1900s or before that, they look great. So they weathered that heat stress way, way, way better than these trees that were intentionally planted in the park as a part of a reforestation project. So it's awfully dry and crunchy everywhere you go. Um, the grasses that we're seeing, I don't feel too terribly guilty about. Um, one is a section of, of um, Cara blue stem, and then the other is a mix of Cara blue stem and Guinea grass. But what is concerning um, is our increasing number of snags and deadfall. Uh, those have impacts potentially to fall on folks. Um, they do make really, really great habitat. But we should already see leafing out. Like we should already start seeing the beginning signs of spring. Um, some of the wisaches in the back are, they're doing it, but those little mesquites in the front aren't. Um, and again, I think this is another section of the park where we didn't make it through the winter time and that these trees truly are just gonna be deadfall um, and not just, ooh, they look bad, but they're dormant, we'll make it through. I always, always, always want to encourage folks to be um, solution oriented. So the best thing we can do as individuals is to collect data um, to help make a bigger map and a, a better aggregate. Um, hopefully all of you are familiar with iNaturalist. You have it on a phone or a tablet. Um, what's your own backyard look like? What trees overwintered really well and you're seeing already budding out and they're doing great? Um, what native plants at your local patch? Maybe you live in an apartment complex. Maybe you don't have a backyard, but you like to go to Hugh Ramsey three times a week or you're coming out to Rasaka, or you're going over to um, the Laguna Vista Nature Trail. Do you feel like you're seeing the same level of like spring response and leafing out and budding out? Or are you noticing the same impacts that I'm noticing? Because if I'm, I'm only one voice, I'm only one park ranger, there's 20, 22 of you, I think, um, that are on the call tonight. So each and every one of you can utilize that iNaturalist and you can help create that data so we have a clear picture. So it's not just one voice being like, hey, the drought's really bad. You can all help me um, lift up that issue and, and hopefully it makes it to some, some bigger ears. So when the park was wet, if we go all the way back to 2018, 2019, we got to see cool stuff regularly. Um, Green kingfishers, roseate skimmers, um, little blue herons are my favorite in the, not technically a heron, more of an egret um, type of wading bird, roseate spoonbills. So all of those were incredibly reliant on our water resources because the Rasaka beds are dry more often than they're wet. Um, they've dispersed from the park. They are now, the birds that can fly are probably fine. Again, our, our future outlook on roseate skimmers I don't know if we'll see those populations rebound. We've gone so long without the necessary resource for their life history that, um, you know, I would see 10 or 20 of them on a hike and now I'm lucky if I get to see one or two. Not only birds and insects, um, you used to be able to like, in the summertime, see um, a little racer or at night as we we're leaving, you could hear the toads. Um, little common ground doves were everywhere, passion flower packs at literally every level. Um, the ones that are really bumming me out the most. So I really love witch moths. I love that they're as big as my face. Um, a band cell sister is not that big. It's just what PowerPoint did when I made the slide. They made them the same size, even though that is not correct. One is like the size of my face and one is the size of my palm. So who's missing from your backyard? Like who's missing? Um, especially if you like to keep um, lists, if you're an e-birder, go back, go back and see what did you see in February of 2022 or 2020 or 2019 and compare it to what you're seeing right now. Um, again, eBird is aggregating that data and then researchers are able to dig into that data and see, see emerging trends. We then know, oh yeah, well, Green Jay counts in Cameron County are down 20%, but that is only possible. The only way that can happen is if um, we're out there doing the work, we're out there making our bird lists.
So we're not helpless, right? Um, what can we do? How can we move forward? And this is where I think y'all um, play the most important role. So you are going to um, ideally complete your TMN training, and then you're gonna start conducting your volunteer hours and you're gonna be out in the community. Um, so you can educate and advocate. So um, I really, really love that in the previous presentation, there was a lot of talk about gardening and planting native plants. I would also add to that, thinking about water conservation in those household landscapes. Um, we gotta get away from lawns. We really, really, really have to let go of our love and addictions to um, monoculture grasses that support nothing. They are literal ecological dead zones that drink up a lot of water. Um, like, do I like having a little yard for my baby to play in? Yes, but have I also left standing every native tree at my house? 100%. Have I removed the non-natives? Yes. So I just pulled this off um, Texas A&M on the Gulf Coast. They were doing a, a class on Zergscaping. So not only is it important to have people to do those trainings, people need to go. So if you see something pop up um, on Facebook or TMN or somebody texts you, take the time and, and go and take away either whatever you learn or at least um, you're building a local communal knowledge base. Maybe you say something to some kid someday and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna plant that tree there because that nice lady said this is a good thing to do. Um, the other thing that we can do for water conservation, because of course, if we are being more conservative with our water resources, then potentially there's more available for us to use um, in the park. So <clears throat> who has that leaky toilet flange that you're like, oh, I gotta replace that? Or whose kitchen sink, the pee trap just drips a little bit every day or your water bill spiked from month to month. Um, being really thoughtful in your own home about the water resources that you use every day. Are you utilizing um, efficient appliances? If you're able to upgrade, can you keep in mind like how many gallons per flush or how many gallons per load of laundry, fixing up all of those leaks? Um, but not everything can be done at a personal level. I really, really love the thought of recycling, but I cannot recycle my way out of um, our plastic in the ocean issue. I can conserve water at home. I can definitely be thoughtful about native planting and zergscaping, but some things have to be done at a larger level. Um, I couldn't find the data for Cameron County, but there are a lot of really exciting projects in Hidalgo and their irrigation districts on how they can conserve water resources going forward. So they're doing interesting things in the way they're lining some of their canals because we lose an incredible amount of water to seepage. And just like in the previous presentation, a lot of those canals are inundated with invasive non-native plants. So it'd be one thing if that's water is seeping, but it is seeping and being drawn up into uh, Montezuma Cypress. Okay, you know, that's no big deal to me, or it's an ebony grove or even an orange grove. I could tolerate that. But to know that we're losing water to seepage and plant drawing um, for non-native invasive plants, there's been a lot of thoughtful work about going underground, so no, no open surface water canals. There's a lot of thoughtfulness about how to prevent evaporation. There have been some very clever solutions implemented all across America. Um, but our current trend is towards aerification. The West is getting drier every year. Our... Um, River basins and watersheds are over allocated. So even small steps that we individually take combined with these larger steps happening at the municipal level, at the state level, at the federal level, all of that plays into having more water resources. Um, and with more water resources, we're able to do more of that habitat conservation. Okay. Like I said, here, um, here is all of my resources. Um, I tried to not go so crazy on the picture so I can actually email this to, to Barbara so then y'all are gonna be able to um, take advantage of any of them. And then my, I have to find it, I have to find it. Oh, the EPA. The EPA is where I got that stat for my very first slide about the 80% of folks in Brownsville not having access um, to green space. 
All right, y'all, that was the brunt of my presentation. I'm actually very proud of myself that um, there's only nine minutes left. I was afraid that I was gonna do it and there'd be 20 or 22 minutes left. So I get a gold star for talking a little bit slower. Um, my last little bit before I'll take any and all of the questions you have is a shameless plug. We are doing our um, 100 year celebration in March. It's right around the corner. We are still looking for volunteers. Um, you could help us in a multitude of ways. Um, you can set up tables, you can do a tabling activity, you could help us park, um, we're doing a run, you could absolutely help us with run and race management. Uh, we'd be happy to help, we'd be happy to have you, just shoot us an email. Great. Or if you just want to come, if you just want to come and have fun, um, we're going to have a food truck, we're doing a 5k, like it's going to be a really fun day in the park to celebrate our 100th birthday. Okay, guys, you gotta ask for more questions. About anything, about anything. Great presentation. Um, Kelly, um, what kind of uh, help do y'all need out there? I saw something about fixing bikes and driving trams. What else? Yeah, so um, we want our volunteers in the park to be connected to the work in a meaningful way. So we, that translates to, um, we don't want y'all to hate the job that we assign you. So if you're like, I don't wanna talk to people, Kelly, um, we're not gonna make you do a tram, be a tram driver or do field trips. If you are really passionate about hopping on mowers and trail maintenance, we're gonna hook you up with our maintenance staff. If you do like to talk to people, then you might drive trams. Um, Alicia and Susan, they do that. They were here this morning. They're um, really phenomenal TMNs. Um, bike fixing, our rental bikes need a lot of love all of the time. A litter patrol, literally just walking around in the park, having a nice little hike with our grabby grabbers and picking up microplastics. Um, that's a job in and of itself. So we, uh, we want you to be happy and feel that the work that you're doing is meaningful and that it's meaningful to both parties, you and us. Okay, I'll email you at that email address down there and find out when uh, yeah. when I can apply the, my time that I have available uh, when when you guys can utilize it. Absolutely, we'd be happy to have you. Thank you. And for for those of you that don't know, Elisa and Susan, Elisa uh, Cavazos and uh, Elisa, not Elisa, Elisa Cavazos and Susan Upton are members of our chapter. And they do a lot of uh, good work out at Rosaka de la Palma. Yep. And you nominated them for an award, correct? We did, and they won. They are the Region 2 um, Volunteers of the Year with uh, Texans for Texas State Parks. That, that was great for you to do that. So they beat everybody else. I love it because it's kind of competitive. That's, that's right. What other questions? I I know everybody loved the field trip out to your park. Um, and that's my big thing. Find your patch, find your place and fall in love with it. And then just like Alicia and Susan, um, they come once a week. I know that's a heck of a commitment. Like they're coming out to the park 50 times a year. I get it, that might not be possible, but at least once a month, go to a place and go to the same spot in that place like my three sickly ebony trees and take your picture and then compare over time like don't trust your memory like document it because your observation might like end up like i can't be in the whole park everywhere all the time sometimes i'm um elbows deep in in budget or i'm figuring out where we're going to find toilet paper or hand soap um but Alicia and Susan might see something that I haven't noticed and say, hey, are you aware of this? Or um, fingers crossed, I hope someday my maintenance staff do see an ocelot and they do get a really clear picture and we can collect DNA evidence and be like, hey, guess what? 2024, that was our year. That's when we had an ocelot in the park. So um, if if they miss the field trip, when do you do the tram tours and things oh sure so we do tram tours um tuesday through sunday four times a day 
9 a.m., 11 a.m., um, 1.30, and 3.30. Um, what you see really depends on the time of day. So right now, our morning field trips have been pretty fruitful. Our afternoons are still a little slow because the butterflies aren't out yet. So when the butterflies are out, the afternoons, we tend to talk a lot about them because they're very showy and moving around a lot. Um, we do thankfully, thankfully have some water in the park. We were able to purchase 20 acre feet and that was pumped in um, yesterday and today. So if you want to see it, you got about two weeks before it dries out into a mud flat. So hurry on out to the park. Um, and it's incredible. So I made that drive yesterday because I was like, where's our water? And it hadn't arrived yet. And there was nothing. It was quiet. You didn't see anything. Um, I went out today and I had a juvenile uh, crested caracara. I had a bunch of squabbling um, kiskadees or green jays. There were some small fly catchers. I didn't have my binos, um, which is always my own dang fault. So it's incredible how invigorated the park becomes when we add that water resource back into the site. That's great. So we've got two weeks to get out there and see water. Yeah, um, and then we'll hope that I get allocated some more um, and then we can pump a, a little bit more in. Um, I would love, I would love if we got a large enough allocation to put water in the north side because accessibility is really important to us. We want everybody to uh, be able to have access to the Rasakas and get to have that experience, but it takes like 50 acre feet of water to fill that thing up. And that's so much water. That's three pumps on the south side or one pump on the north. It just doesn't make good sense. We want the water to have the most impact for the wildlife while also still giving folks recreational opportunities to bird um, and enjoy the site. Well, that makes sense. You know, on that subject of water and perhaps water retention, uh, when I drove up there the other day coming from 281, I guess coming what, uh, north, I noticed as I approached the entrance, there looked to be what what appeared to be like many drainage canals coming out. What, uh, I mean, if you're going to lose your water, uh, where is that? And plus, where is that draining to? It, it's the opposite. So we play a role in flood prevention and drainage for New Carmen Avenue. So in a large scale rain event, um, the water drains into those pipes and then drains into the park. And uh. it's been um, a little bit of a, a mixed bag. Um, so to some extent, roadways bring with them um, some level of contaminant in the water. But at the same time, wetland habitats are actually pretty good as, as carbon sinks and pretty good um, at filtering some of those um, pollutants out. So then the water that actually ends up in the Rasaka itself is of a reasonably good quality. Um, and keep in mind that we're pumping water in from the Rio Grande River. So this is a river that's inundated with all sorts of things. So agricultural waste, human waste, that pet waste, um, that's ending up in there. So when I had to shop this around and when some people were like, well, and I was like, uh-uh, like that water has the ability to do good at this site. There's no perfect water anymore. And the water that we get and we bring in is probably contaminated to the same level as what the water from the ah. is coming. No, probably worse. We're at the tail end of Rio Grande, so we get yeah. everybody's junk. Exactly. Uh, and all, it's an old joke. I've lived here all my life, and we used to drink tap water all our life as a kid anyway. But anyway, yeah, you answered my question. Thank you. Yep. And Sophia has been answering some questions about the tram rides and. Perfect. And that internship is paying off. Absolutely. And hey, I am going to plug this too. So um, we are offering um, a TPWD full time paid internship this summer. So if you have a student in your life who you think would be interested in an internship um, with the agency, um, interested in, in land conservation, um, they have to either be currently enrolled in university or uh, within graduated within six months of their start date, which for us would be June 1st. Um, but send them our way. All three parks in the Valley, we all got paid internship opportunities. So if you go to the agency's website, um, those students can end up with, you know, really great opportunities to potentially start a career. I'm a park ranger because of my college internship. I was all geared up to go to vet school. I suffered needlessly through organic chemistry to become a park ranger. 
<laughs> I could have taken geology. I could have been out there licking rocks. <laughs> I did not know that. Yep, I was on track for vet school until my internship, and then now Park Ranger Kelly instead of Dr. Kelly. <laughs> well, I think that... I landed on my feet. I feel like I landed in a pretty yeah. good spot. Yeah, I think you're where you are supposed to be. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Kelly. It was very informative. There lost our game. Absolutely. Um, and we... We'll certainly, I'm sure you'll certainly see more of our class out at your park and hopefully on the 11th, they'll be able to help you with the event that you're having. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And, as um, far and as if anybody the, wants this presentation, um, I will email it to Barbara and she can um, disseminate it amongst y'all. Um, if nothing else, like, don't take my word for it. Read through those source resources, like read the Ocelot pamphlet or go through, um, the eco regions. I did include a YouTube link, but it's a little bit dated. Um, so I didn't want to play it cause I was like, mm, not all of this is great. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and, and you're, I, I guess I didn't ask you if it was okay to record you, but we have recorded you and we'll put it up on Perfect. YouTube. And they'll get to okay. see you over and over and over again. Are and you? I believe your, I believe your tree walk is uh, is on there too. So I love <laughs> the photo that you picked of me, where I'm like standing in front of the tree, being like, "Look, there's a tree." <laughs> I think that was from the. Uh, these guys don't know it, but two, year, two years ago, we uh, when the pandemic hit, we had to have no in-person classes and no in-person field trips. So Robert became a videographer and Kelly was good enough to play along and he he went out to Rosafa de la Palma and uh, videoed her talking about the trees. And then I think he added music and stuff. He he videoed me doing the walk at Ramsey too. So, um, you did a great job. You were much more animated than. No, nah, I, I get a little excited about plants, but you get very excited about trees. I get that, I get that all the time. But, but I had um, uh, a French yeah. Canadian man check in yesterday and he's like, you're so wiggly when you talk. And I was like, thank you, yeah. sir. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe that's getting lost in translation. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I, I need to remember that you're very wiggly. Yeah. I was like, um, true. I can't, I can't disagree with that. I think your enthusiasm, it, it just oozes out of every one of your pores. So. The valley that's probably cool. why you're wiggly. It's such a cool, magical place. Um, and you know, I want all of us to be motivated and invigorated to do what we can to protect the natural resources that occur here because some of them don't occur anywhere else on the entire planet. It's us, it's our job. We gotta do it. Absolutely. And every time I drive, I, I see more habitat just bulldoze down. And uh it just makes me crazy. Oh, I don't know who said this, but yes, I did get excited about ball moss. I, I, um, they went on the Ramsey tour last weekend, last Saturday. Uh, so yes, I do get excited about ball moss. I think it's so, uh, it's so cool. So, <laughs> so. You, you're an you're an inspiration to all of us, Kellyanne. And we we really well, thank you for uh, your presentation yeah. and for spending the evening with us. I was happy to. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Have a good rest of the evening. Yep. Bye, y'all. Thanks. Bye, Kellyanne.